Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us this evening. We know that it's an incredibly busy time of the year, so we really appreciate you taking times out of your very busy diaries to join us. We're so thrilled tonight to really deep dive and focus on tech jobs. And this is part of the City of Sydney's Visiting Entrepreneurs Program, which they've been really proud to present this year. There's been many events, which I hope many of you have had the opportunity to pop and say hello to. Um, without any further ado, I'd love to first start the proceedings by welcoming Councillor Robert Cock. Uh, thank you, uh, Joe, and hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome to our final Small Business Digital 101 seminar um, for this year. Um, firstly, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the ERR Nation, the traditional custodians of our land, and uh, to pay my respects to the elders, both past and present. And I also acknowledge the people of the 200 nationalities who um, reside in our wonderfully diverse and multicultural city. Um, of course, uh, I'd like to welcome this evening's expert speakers and uh, panel members. Um, they are uh, Louis McVinney, the UTS Dean of Faculty of um, Transdisciplinary Innovation. Uh, Alex Gruska, uh, the CEO of Startup Oz, author of the uh, Talent Gap Report. UX uh, panelists, Rebecca Anya Lowry, um, user experience designer, us too. Data analyst, uh, panelist, Bing Ong, a data scientist, uh, product manager panelist, uh, Magna Griffiths, who is our senior product manager with um, Gumtree. Uh, BDM panelist, Adam Long, uh, the business development manager, of, um, a CEO of Smarter Drafter and director of uh, Conscious Steps. Today, when most people talk about the tech sector, the discussion uh, often focuses on smart devices and apps, perhaps um, apps, you know, perhaps, um, you know, uh, also data stored in, in, in the cloud. Um, I guess I'm, I'm of the um, generation when I was, um, you know, I guess in your, at your age, I uh, was using phones. And the phones were, you know, those dial-ons that you call my friends. And then if I had to dial, I wanted to call a friend overseas, I had to dial the operator who has to connect me to the number overseas. So, so much has changed. Um, but however, back to um, the most critical component of the tech sector today is people and the value they bring through their skills, knowledge, and expertise. This is especially true uh, for emerging tech startups. Uh, tech skills are high in demand in Australia and around the world, um, as we all know it. But there are key skills uh, gaps. You know, specifically, uh, some skills are higher in demand than others. The recent startup Oz Talent Gap report is significant and very useful, providing detailed evidence about the gaps that exist and, the con and contributing to our understanding of the skills context of the Australian tech sector. So specifically, it identifies and profiles the four tech roles that are in immediate high demand. In tonight's seminar, as well as giving you an introduction to Sydney's uh, tech startup e ecosystem, you will gain an in-depth introduction to these four cutting-edge role types. Tonight's panel uh, members are experts who are working in each of the identified roles. Data scientist, user experience designer, product manager, and business development manager. They will help you understand the critical impact that each role can contribute to the tech startup. What, what it, um, it is they actually do, um, the pathway they took to working in the role, and what it is they most enjoyed about it. So we know that um, start a tech, startup tech, a tech sector is constantly changing, and many of these skills and roles have only emerged in the last 10 years and are only found in this sector. So why are these four roles so critical? Well, one, because when done well, they have the capacity to trigger growth and in turn, stimulate further job growth. Eventu uh, equally, a shortage of these critical skills can inhibit growth. So globally, both new and well-established tech firms are looking for similar roles to recruit, which means that Sydney's startups are competing for talented employees in what can be cutthroat global talent pool. So Australia has some key advantages. 
the quality of both our education system and our workforce. However, as Startup Oz report identifies, we are potentially curbing growth in the wider, community, uh, wider economy by not meeting the demand for some of the most important jobs in the technology sector. So I wish you all um, an informative and stimulating evening tonight. So enjoy. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Councillor Cook. So my name is Joe Kelly. I'm going to be helping moderate this evening and helping us work our way through the agenda. So tonight's focus is we have a couple of key speakers who are going to share some really interesting knowledge with them, with you, I should say, and hopefully inspire you, for those of you in the room wondering if the tech industry is your next big move. We're going to then have a curated panel where we're going to talk in a lot more about the day in the life of, the different roles, the different things that the people are doing right now, and to help you define what those roles and skills are. We're then going to end the evening with a bit of an opportunity for networking, so we'd love it if you were here at the end of the evening to have that opportunity to talk to each of our speakers. If you are interested in following us tonight on social, we are actually hashtag, it's just up there behind me on the screen, which is VEPSID, so we'd love it if you could share that with your network so we can further let people know uh, what is actually happening in the digital ecosystem here in Sydney. The City of Sydney has been focused on the digital economy for a number of years, and it's really exciting tonight that we're looking really firsthand at the skills, because we're really passionate about ensuring that there is opportunities for people to find work within this wonderful city. So with that in mind, our very first speaker tonight, Louise McWinney, is from the University of Technology, Sydney. She has just started an incredibly exciting role at the university, which I won't steal her thunder to tell you what it is. But why it's exciting is because it really is focusing on the opportunity of training people right here in Sydney for these really exciting new jobs and new opportunities. So I might welcome Le Louise and you can tell everyone exactly your role. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's ominous or not. Um, thanks, Joe. Um, firstly, I'd like to say thank you to Microsoft, Google, LinkedIn, and UTS for the scope of the Startup Talent Gap Report tonight, and of course the City of Sydney for this evening. It's a wonderful reflection of Sydney that we're together to talk about the talent and the future of the Australian tech sector. And Alex will be coming up shortly to talk about the specifics of that report I just held up. However, I'd like to start off by introducing myself not by what my job title says that I am, although my mother loves my job title, but who I am. I am fascinated by wicked problems, where single disciplines alone are not enough to deal with the complexity of the challenges we face, where complexity and technology require not simply the combination of singular disciplines to generate new forms of thinking, but new abilities in hybrid thinking. I work in the space of curiosity. I'm curious about the dreams of the past, of this future that is now our present. A future that is, and also at times, never was. I'm also fascinated by the future as we build it and it unfolds. By the scope of artificial intelligence, by AI writing, by the potential and ethics of drones for new forms of data gathering, by how an autonomous car is programmed to recognize and react to the movement of an approaching moose in America or an elk in Europe, but cannot then recognize the approach pattern of a kangaroo in Australia. I'm fascinated by face recognition and its implications, by the use of geospatial technology, by inventions and technology created for one purpose with often unforeseen potential for other purposes. I'm fascinated not simply by coding, but by the role of our culture in what we code. I'm fascinated by bio biomimicry, by swarm intelligence and flocking behavior. I'm fascinated by big data and the ethics for us as individuals and our society, by human-centeredness in the advance of technology, and I agonize over the lack of digitized visual language to cope with our digital age so that ancient written and also oral languages are condemned to die out. I'm also fascinated by why inequality exists, how it perpetuates itself, 
and how that gap will potentially widen through access or lack of access to technology and education. My list obviously speaks to the education that we're producing for our students, but also to those in the work environment upskilling hard and soft skills to move with and lead change. Alex is going to present the specifics around the report and the identification of the talent gaps the research has revealed. But I want to engage in a wider introduction about the time that all of us in this room find ourselves in and the fact that many roles are not yet identifiable and what this actually means for us in the workforce as well as our future workforce. Innovation is shifting the very nature of the problems and challenges in the world towards becoming open, complex, dynamic, and networked. We therefore need to develop radically different ways of working, and that, of course, requires a transformation in how we prepare for our future and upskill our current talent. Existing ways of doing things are all too often proving to be a mismatch for immediate and future needs and the skills needed now and into the future are being massively disrupted by the complexity of the problems that we face. For me, that means that as the Dean of the Faculty of Transdisciplinary Innovation at the University of Technology, Sydney, I work in the first new UTS faculty in over 20 years and the only faculty of its kind in Australia. We have seven undergraduate and postgraduate degrees and growing spanning innovation, creative intelligence, technology, data science, animation, all of which forefront critical and creative thinking, problem solving, problem posing, innovation, invention, complexity, entrepreneurship, and preparing these students for the jobs of the future. Now the need for such a forward focused course and courses requires that we work across and between the traditional definitions of disciplines and the scale and speed of change that we're engaged with, particularly in the tech space, means that we're also deeply engaged in the role that education, industry engagement, and lifelong learning needs to play in accelerating Australia's forward momentum. People talk about this as the fourth industrial revolution, or the second renaissance, or even the perfect storm. But as the Vice-Chancellor of UTS recently said, people often naively talk about the future of work as some distant point in time. But the future is here, now. So we're in a time when technology does not simply provide tools to improve our lives, but generates new thinking that's powerful enough to enable quantum, behavioral, and societal change. None of you in this room will doubt this. Although, to occasionally remind myself, I use a very simple set of images. Our younger generation have been raised as tech natives, who have no memory of what it was like not to have multiple mobile devices and permanent access to constant communication, research, and the whole world in real time. Or of having a profile that anyone in the world can see, or the ability to take a photograph or film an event and upload it in seconds to make it accessible by the entire world within minutes. Our mobile devices have changed our social and cultural behavior in a very short time. If you have any reason to doubt this, here is the crowd in Rome prior to the 2005 papal election of Pope Benedict XVI. Seven years and 315 days later, this is the time prior to the announcement of the election of the next Pope, and everyone is viewing the event through their own mobile devices. In 2013, everyone here is facing forward with their mobile device in front of them. Three years later, however, <laughs> can you even begin to imagine what previous generations would make of an image showing everyone turning their back on the first female US presidential candidate? A time where every event requires that people turn their back on historical moments to insert their presence in history by foregrounding themselves. In doing this, 
They abandon all previous protocol and social etiquette. An admittedly flippant example, but thinking deeper, it's easy to see that radical reshaping of human needs and how interaction is revolution, revolutionizing sectors such as energy, education, entertainment, person-to-person -person communication, media, advertising, transport, travel, shopping, recruitment. Meanwhile, innovation has driven us towards a more globalized world and technology has dissolved borders and disciplines and transformed who we consider our neighbors, our customers, and our competitors. We have to engage in greater complexity than ever before, seeking connectivity in that complexity between and across what were traditional and often siloed professions, specialisms, or disciplines. We're increasingly mobile and networked in a culture that rapidly demands that we're innovative, adaptive, and outcomes-driven, but less concerned with conventions in achieving outcomes. Innovation is, of course, specifically propelling one sector to adapt and thrive in this complexity, and that is the startup sector. You'll recognize a lot of the startups operating because they are thriving. Startups are a vital part of the paradigm shift, forging new growth and opportunity in the tech sector. They're nimble, opportunistic, and can adapt to change in ways that large organizations cannot. To thrive in the startup environment, people need to be entrepreneurial, resilient, understand and know how to navigate complexity, be comfortable with uncertainty, and how to learn or acquire a skill they need just in time. So, as an educationalist, working in the space of complexity, future thinking, and startups, I have to ask the fundamental question, what kind of university does a new generation need for this changing world, when potentially jobs that will exist in 2030 do not presently exist? But also, what place does the university play with our industries in creating opportunities for lifelong learning? Because learning doesn't stop when you get that degree or that piece of paper. In fact, quite the opposite. Lifelong learning is an important societal shift when our work futures are changing so rapidly. Just-in-time learning, micro-credentials, blended learning, short courses are all the ways of the future for people of all ages who work in global and rapidly changing and shifting economies, allowing us to rethink ourselves, adapt to change, upskill, and create change in the way in which we navigate and take charge of our own work destinies. So, what does this shifting time mean for the emergent generation of employees graduating from our universities and colleges, as taught by academics whose parents had jobs for life, whilst our students will have a life of jobs? This has meant a significant change in what our universities are. With great change also comes great responsibility, not simply preparing students, but also members of industry to be new kinds of employees, new kinds of employers, and new kinds of leaders. Universities and the education sector as a whole have always worked with industry in leading research. Now we also work with government, corporations, and the startup community to conceptualize a future of change and growth for not only named jobs, but building agility and capabilities that will grow with the changes ahead and also lead them. Many UTS students aspire to be their own boss and form or start or join a startup. We know this talent needs skills support of a solid network, which many of the partners provided in this report and even in this room have been providing. So yes, this report identifies we have skill gaps and key shortages in Australia in the high tech sector, and it's critical that we address this. The report identifies migration and education as potential solutions to the need for injected talent. I have to assume that in the report identifying migration, that this also includes repatriation, given the large and highly successful and innovative population of Australians overseas, particularly in Silicon Valley, where the Australian mafia, as it's known, is punching far, far above its weight. The integration of education and industry and the tech startup ecosystem 
is vital if research, innovation and the tech sector are to work hand in hand. Using the US as an example, it is no coincidence that Silicon Valley was formed alongside Stanford University. The Boston startup culture is adjacent to Harvard and MIT, and that the US's fifth largest startup tech hub in North Carolina is centered within a triangle of three major universities. We already know this. We're working hard on it in Sydney. Six years ago, UTS start, set out to understand not only the technological revolution, but what we recognized was an ideas revolution, and the faculty of transdisciplinary innovation emerged. It was obvious that industry needed different types of employees to explore complex problems from multiple perspectives. With rapidly moving complexity, our driving question was, should people with the same knowledge address big issues? And educationally, what kind of university does new technology and a new generation of employees require? This is a time when our students are working hard and hand in hand with industry, startups, government, and the not-for-profit sector from their very first subject in their very first year of their university education. This is vital for students, but please don't for a minute think that this is all one way, as industry gains as much as the students with access to a new generation bringing their perspective to partner issues. It's vital that industry contributes to education and education to industry, so new advances are made, new talent is generated, and new perspectives formed where learning and lifelong learning is available for all. If you want to see some evidence about what I'm saying, according to the World Economic Forum, in many industries and countries, the most in-demand occupations or specialities did not exist 10 years or even five years ago. I find that to be a, an incredibly conservative prediction. Our first cohort of faculty graduates graduated this year and have progressed into the sum of these jobs with job titles that did not exist when they entered their degree four years previously. Innovation analyst, transformation designer. We also have our first Silicon Valley startup co-founder at the age of 23. That makes an interesting challenge for us in the universities when we're asked by parents to name what jobs their children will graduate into. So, the Startup Talent Gap report identifies the highly skilled thinkers that we require in the tech and startup ecosystem, but also the significant level of global competition for such people. To compete for these people, we need to provide the right environment for innovation and preempt what people will need to flourish in work and home environments for the coming years. In addition to the identified people gaps in the report are also the unidentified gaps. And that throws down the challenge of how we need to upskill our present workforce as well as prepare upcoming generations for the technological innovation that exists in the cracks in the pavement between these jobs. And how we need to prepare to build this city's and this country's competitive future. That's the challenge of my job, and it's also the challenge for every single person in this room. Thank you. Wow. I'm feeling like my, my, my job has been around forever. <laughs> The job that I've certainly had. Thank you so much, Louise. If any of you would like to recapture anything that Louise talked about tonight, we are videoing this, this evening's proceedings, so you will have an opportunity to, uh, to look back over that and, and take away some of those key things uh, in those messages. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll pop a link to you in the next several days, so thank you so much for that, Louise. Alex Grushka is our next uh, guest tonight. He's going to come up and talk all about the report that Louise um, mentioned several times. He's a Chief Operating Officer 
at Startup Oz. Startup Oz and UTS are our event partners tonight, so we would like to thank both of you uh, for that on behalf of the city. Uh, Alex has actually been the Chief Operating Officer there for, for uh, several years. His head role is Research Data and Communications. He's previously co-authored uh, Powering Growth Ag Tech Report and edited The Crossroads in 2016 and 2017. So Alex is going to pop up on stage now and give us a rapid fire view through some of the key research findings. So welcome, Alex. Today, thank you very much. It's always good hearing your bio read back to you because you sound super impressive. Um, I, I think of myself as the nerd, um, but occasionally I get wheeled out to events like this and I end up with a, a more of a tan than I had just from the bus, so that's great. Um, let me click through. So uh, I work for Startup Oz. We're a not-for-profit um, that make it our mission to make Australia one of the best places in the world to build and grow a tech startup. Um, we do that because tech uh, businesses and, uh, start from startups, and tech businesses are the future of the Australian economy pretty clearly. Um, in the five years that we were just talking about for, for new roles, uh, five years ago, Facebook IPO'd to uh, make itself overnight larger than any Australian company that exists, and in those five years, it's quadrupled in size. Um, there's no question that, that um, tech is the future for Australia in terms of providing jobs uh, for the people in it. Uh, so we do research like this, uh, research into how the tech sector uh, affects uh, traditional industries like construction or agriculture, and also broadly, what are the sort of settings that we need to tweak in Australia to make it uh, a good place to build and grow a tech startup. Uh, we also do events uh, like this policy hack we did in Brisbane, uh, where we got 150 of Australia's uh, most prominent uh, investors, founders, uh, politicians and university uh, professionals, and got them all in a room talking about some of those issues. How can we improve migration? How can we improve um, startup corporate collaboration and various other sort of policy-focused things? Um, but I'm here to talk to you about the startup talent gap. So this report came about because we'd been hearing from startups in the tech sector for quite a long time that uh, there was a talent gap and they really, really needed people, but there wasn't very much research done into actually what those people were, what they did, what their skills were, what their roles were in the business. Um, so we wanted to do a little bit more, more research there. And there's actually quite a lot of public uh, uh, interest in that topic as well. Um, this is a, a study by Core Data which asked parents uh, do you feel confident that you understand what kind of jobs will be available in 20 years? And 70% 70, 70 of them were basic, basically said, no, I'd love to meet the 2% who are extremely confident about what jobs <laughs> were there in 20 years' time. But there are some themes that we can pull apart from what we think that is, is going to happen. And, and most people said that, for example, interacting with smart technology or that technology disrupting uh, employments and industries were going to play a part. So we can be confident about some of the themes, but we don't know exactly what, what the roles were. Uh, so we approached it in a couple of ways. Um, these are all Australian startups. I know when I say startups, often we think of a couple of people in a garage eating pot noodles. Um, but these are the ones that have been really successful and have grown to actually quite big businesses. So all these businesses are Australian, and they're all over $50 million valuations. And uh, the bottom left there, there's Canva, which is a $1 billion US valuation. It's our first private unicorn, excluding Atlassian, which I went to the US. So we're, we're semi not counting them. Um, but we went and talked to the founders of all these businesses and asked them, things like what roles have been really important over the last six months, uh, what roles are really important now, what's going to be important for you in the, in the next little while, what have you had real difficulty um, uh, being able to hire when you've been looking around, what, have you, what skills are you most prioritizing? And through that, we could extrapolate a bit about um, where there were, were gaps in the, in the ecosystem. Um, but we wanted to have a, a bigger data set than just talking to, to founders of some of Australia's uh, prominent businesses. So we tapped into our partners' uh, LinkedIn. They have a tremendously large data set. You'll note uh, 10 million people in Australia. I think there's about 12 million full-time workers, so the, the capturing is about 80% or something of, of uh, Australia's uh, full-time workers. Um, so we're able to aggregate all that, that data and look at both sides of the LinkedIn platform. So on one side, there's um, the job roles themselves, so you know you can advertise for jobs on LinkedIn, and we could do things like look at how long those job ads were up for, how many applications they got, um, that sort of stuff. And on the other side, there's the profiles of the people. So we could look at who is calling themselves a data scientist, what skills do they list, what education did they have, what previous roles did they have, and whereabouts have they moved in the world, like which countries have they changed to. 
And from that, we could answer some interesting questions. So for example, this is countries by share of migrant hiring. So we can look at um, how many people were moving around. And one of the concerns about migration as a solution to the talent gap is um, a concern that we are accepting too many people into Australia. And we can pretty comprehensively say, we're not. We're just middle of the pack. Sorry, that's just that's where we are. Um, Germany are importing a whole lot of people. The US, not so much, because they already have a very developed tech sector, and we're roughly in the middle. So um, we can sort of safely answer that question. Um, this was kind of an, an interesting finding. So in Singapore, uh, well, so the, the role of a data scientist um, basically has two components. It has one component, which is analyzing the data and finding sort of insight and commercial um, outcomes from the data. And the other side is the tech ability to actually manipulate the data, so the, the technical coding background. And you can see that in Singapore, data scientists, or people who listed themselves as data scientists, most often came from a data engineer background. When you look to Australia, people who list themselves as data scientists most often come from a research assistant background. So you can see under different parts of the, the cultural landscape are providing access to these uh, new roles, but they're both finding themselves at the data science position because that's the position that's really in demand. Uh, so we ended up uh, highlighting four roles from the data that came out. Um, these roles, there, there are lots and lots of uh, different uh, roles and skills, the role title that you have on your business card might not be the same one you put on your LinkedIn profile or the one that you tell your mum. So I'm aware that, that there's always some wiggle room in this. Um, but these four roles consistently came up as ones that were really in demand by Australian startups. And in particular, in overseas uh, mature ecosystems, these were the ones that were absolutely most in demand. So data scientists, for example, is the most imported role in the US, and they don't import as many people into their tech scene as, as most other startup ecosystems. So they're the roles that we're going to explore right now. Thank you Thanks. so much, Alex. We certainly are. We had four years ago Melanie Perkins from Canva on this very stage. She hadn't yet launched Canva. Um, she was talking about launching it. She was on this stage, I think, a month before she actually launched Canva. And it just goes to show in 2014, she began, began the concept in 2012, but in 2014 actually launched. And it just goes to show how rapidly and how successful some Australian startups have actually been. Similarly, we had um, Tim Fung from Airtasker here the following year. Uh, they were mucking around with the concept when he was on the stage, hoping it would succeed. Now, I was just in LA recently. My son left his iPad in the hotel room. We were an hour and a half away. There is no air tasker in LA. I could not get that <laughs> iPad and it's still now stuck in the LA hotel room, which we know where it is. We just can't get it back. But it just goes to show when you have a real problem, the potential solutions are there. And if you haven't looked at Canva or Air Tasker in any detail, do, do, do that because they're exceptional examples of uh, our homegrown tech stories of, of real great success. So I'd now like to introduce four of our specialist speakers tonight that are going to share with you their skills, their experiences, and their journey in the tech industry. So I might start off with Beck Lowry. She's actually what is known as a UX designer. I'm going to let Beck tell us a little bit more about that as she joins uh, the stage. So welcome. She's from us too, and she has a background in visual design, but again, I'll let her share that with, her, her, with us in a moment. Bing Ong is actually a data scientist. She's from Daisy. She's also going to be sharing some of her knowledge with us. Uh, we have Magna Griffiths. She's uh, from Gumtree, uh, and she has an entrepreneurial product management background, and again, I'll allow... Uh, to tell you a little bit more about that as the night goes on. And lastly, we have Adam Long. He's the CEO and director of two different <laughs> places. And Adam might share with you right off the bat why he's wearing no shoes. <laughs> you might <laughs> to kick us off, Adam. Yeah, sure. So nice to meet you all. I'm Adam Long. I'm the CEO of an AI for lawyers company called Smarter Drafter, also the director and founder of Conscious Step. These are socks <laughs> that fight poverty. For example, these ones uh, provide 18 months of clean water through water.org. These ones, on the other hand, feed three kids in refugee camps through Action Against Hunger for every pair that we sell. Uh, we're, we're not about promoting tonight, so I won't mention that it's called <laughs> Conscious Step uh, more than once. Uh, I won't mention that it's Christmas, and I won't mention that the code Adam sent me will get you a discount. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. Welcome. And Magna, can you please tell us a little bit about um, where you're from? 
Uh, yeah, so I'm, uh, I work at Gumtree. I'm the senior product manager there. Uh, and I basically work with technology and engineering teams to build products that um, our customers want and will use um, that actually meet business objectives. So um, I work in a cross-functional team, meaning I work with, as I said, developers, but also um, analysts, testers, um, people from various business units, such as marketing or sales. I capture their uh, needs and also um, capture customers' needs and create products and features that, um, that serve both. Fantastic, and we're going to come back and learn a lot more about that as the, as the night progresses. Bing, can you tell us a little bit about your role and what you do? Yeah, I'm currently a data scientist at DAISY, which is a local um, AI startup. So uh, at DAISY, I'm involved with a product that's called LISA, which is an acronym for Linguistic Interpretive Semantic Analysis. So um, I deal with natural language processing, and effectively we take uh, calls from call centers and and put them through, um, and in the end we churn out results that um, tell the call center whether the, their agents are behaving in a manner that they want their agents to represent the company in. So um, that could be in the form of um, scorecards, behavioral and so forth, and what are the things that they look out for um, in scoring how agents deal with um, calls and so forth. So that's what I do with in Daisy, churning out insights for cus for customers. And yeah. thankfully, Lisa worked as a good acronym, because the <laughs> others are a bit of a handful, isn't it, to, <laughs> to work with? Thank you. And Beck, can you tell us a little bit about your role? Hi, my name's Beck. I work for an agency called Us Two. They're most famous for a mobile game called Monument Valley and Monument Valley Two, which is now being turned into a movie, which is pretty crazy. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> <laughs> um, but my job title is product designer, which is this nice little blend between visual design and user experience design or UX design. And I guess I'll talk a bit more about that later on. Fantastic. Thank you. So, Alex, can you start us off? You, both Louise and you identified that many of these roles didn't exist and that they've really come about in the last sort of five some maybe 10 years ago. Can you talk about um, what you see and what the research has shown us about the types of jobs that Sydney needs? Yeah, so I, I think one of the key features of, of these jobs are that um, they're taking similar, or like traditional jobs and adding a twist or adding something extra. Yep. Um, so you'll find that, um, for example, a business development manager, his main fun function is to bring uh, business uh, in, bring, bring revenue in, but they do that not through necessarily traditional sales channels, but by having a more networking approach, they are more understanding of the product that they're selling, they're more able to assist customers, and um, the way that they work with clients is, is on a longer sales cycle, they meet them at events, and they network. Um, so it's, it's sort of similar skills, but, but adding something a little bit extra. Um, and I think, like we were talking earlier, and, and one of the things that united all of the, the roles was a very big focus on problem. And this is pretty common amongst startups, yep. but the idea is that the, a startup exists to solve a problem, and everything that, that it builds flows out of that. And I think all of these roles specialize in that problem to some degree. Yeah, fantastic. Can you jump in, Adam, and talk about, from your perspective, in your role as looking after the business development side of, of your tech experience, what, what exactly do you, to, to let people know a little bit more insight and what that looks like for you? Yeah, sure. So ultimately, the, the role of business development is about making customers flow, bringing customers into the business. Now, in the olden days, there used to be a marketing manager, and their job was to make uh, customers appear, and then it was a sales manager, and it was their job to make customers pay. Now, somewhere <laughs> along the line, that got a little bit merged, and now it's really very much treated as one function, and in fact, it, it, it does seep into everything that everyone else on the stage does as well. How do you get customers to appear? How do you get them to pay? How do you get them to refer beyond? So traditional channels have, have morphed in different ways. To At one end of the spectrum, a business development manager may be trying to convince a bank or an enterprise to switch the basis of their entire software system. At the other end, a business development manager may actually be having one-on-one -on -one conversations with mums and dads or individual uh, potential customers. Somewhere in the middle, a business development manager might be looking for other ways to bring customers in 
partnerships with other businesses, uh, media alliances, uh, uh, product changes and product agreements with other companies, all of these with the goal of making customers flow. Fantastic, thank you. Matt, can you tell everyone a little bit about your background? And as I've understood um, from my conversations with you in, in, um, in before tonight, is that you worked in a retail job. And you did that traditional thing that, yes. that Adam just talked about. I was a dirty salesman. <laughs> <laughs> how did you find that experience and what you did there transferable? I guess, well, how did that start your passion to be thinking about user experience and, and products and how you take them into a tech environment? I think what was interesting about that is realizing how much I, how many, how much my skills that I learned from customer experience, like stakeholder management, client management, and also creating the ideal experience for someone as they walk into a store, their experience while being in the store and interacting with the store, and then leaving the store and re-engaging them after that. And so much of that is um, knowledge or logic that I don't even realize half the time that I translate into when I'm designing an app or a digital experience. I'm like, oh, can definitely... I, I remember doing that with a customer back when I was... 17 years old, and it's so funny how, how much of that, um, how many of those experiences from such a seemingly mundane job that I draw upon my, in my daily life. You. And Nagdi, can you talk about from your own, uh, your own experiences pre what you're doing now, what kinds of uh, roles did you previously have and how have you translated those into what you do now? Yeah, so in the late 90s, I started to, uh, I was studying design um, and I specialised in graphic design. And that was sort of like by uh, early 2000s when websites started to take off. So I applied my design skills in building uh, websites for various small businesses. Um, and then um, just because I sort of, I was curious about the technology, uh, I started to understand how search engines work and how to rank some of these small business websites um, and that eventually um, I scored a role at MSN and that was basically my path into, well, I wasn't actually doing design at MSN, I was uh, optimising the content from their print materials because MSN is um, a partnership uh, and um, a joint venture between uh, ACP, Channel 9 and MSN and so bringing in the print material so that again it's um, found on the website and then the role quickly shifted once I showed other um, capabilities uh, and yeah, ultimately it was understanding uh, what customers wanted from that experience, but also what the business needs were, and I was able to translate uh, customer needs um, into products. So my focus was entertainment and building out entertainment um, within 9MSN, and then um, ensuring that it's commercial. Fantastic. And Ben, can you talk from your experience? Alex raised the point that Everyone on stage has got an area where problem solving is a, part, a big part of what they do. Can you talk about from your perspective how, how you help to solve problems through the data work that you do and the data analysis work you do? So I, I find that data science is a team sport, so everyone plays a part, and, and I think where your experiences to uh, the richer that it is, the more that you're, bring, you're able to bring the different roles together. So, so essentially there is the um, product, uh, the, the management consultant that brings you qualifies the customers problems and and see where our solutions can fit in and there is the uh, product management that can bring the voice of the customer in that okay this is our product and what are the benefits that it can do and and and, and even when after we have churned after we have worked with the data and we have done the data wrangling and um, churn out results we have to look on behalf of uh, to the eyes too, or work with the UX designer too. So, in what manner would the uh, data um, uh, be represented best? Like, for example, um, in, in these are the product that we work with. So, uh, we 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 have aggregated scores on the dashboard, and all that we can drill down to. Why is a certain department behave um, scoring badly? And then we can drill down further, and then we then we can bring up, um, you know, we, we want to be able to understand what kind of data needs to be present 
um, in order for the output to be shown correctly on the UX, for example. So, so it's a team sport, and, and I think everyone plays a part in, in making the solution shine. Fantastic. Yeah. And so can you talk about, from your point of view, Adam, how, how you work with the customer and how the data that, that you learn through the, the data scientists that you work with and within the, your field, how, how you then relate that into, into your role being in business development? Yeah, sure. So I, I think that one of the key insights already is that none of us work in silos. There's so much cross-pollination. So if I want my business development team to do a better job, I might ask the data scientist to tell us, what is it about our best paying customers, our ones that retain, what makes them the same? What's unique? So then we can get the marketing team to try and identify more of them and the sales team to spend more time on the ones that match that description better. When we talk to customers, they tell us what other problems they have. Or they say, you know what, we like your software, but mm, here's what's actually more important. Or does it do this? That's a problem that we need to solve. And the product manager's role is then to find new ways to solve that. Now, the UX comes into it because you can have a great solution to a problem, but if you have a bad UX, no one's going to use it. No one will find the time to learn how to use it. And UX is, is all about making sure it's adopted. And the, the bottom line here is that it all, all strings together. So we've got a whiteboard in our office with the algorithm of the entire business. It's sort of six levels deep. At the top level, it says revenue minus cost equals profit, obviously. <laughs> they say, all right, well, what makes up revenue? Revenue is the number of customers by the number of times they buy it by how much they spend. What drives the number of customers? Right, well, it's the top of the funnel multiplied by conversion rates. By the time you get about six levels down and you're thinking about, okay, well, how does a particular incentive program for, start, for salespeople ch uh, change the type of customers that turn up and how much they pay? You need this data to get there. You need the UX to get it right, and you need the, the product tools to get there. So once you've got this algorithm on, uh, on a whiteboard for how a business operates, you can start to see who's going to tweak things where, where you want to dedicate resources in order to change it all. And believe it or not, by the time you've got this algorithm on the page, it kind of feels like a game of Age of Empires. And there's your map. <laughs> Maybe not Age of Empires. Starcraft, Warcraft, chess, whatever you play. <laughs> it's a game, and there's data to play with. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you. So, Magna, from your point of view as product manager, how important is stakeholder manager and why is that a, a key skill or a key, key part of the role that you have? Yeah, so with, um, if you're looking at moving into a product role, uh, it is very important. Um, firstly, because it is quite, a, I guess, a, we, we're dealing with so many different stakeholders, whether it is the um, parts of the business, um, from management uh, through to marketing, uh, business development managers, and um, taking their needs and understanding maybe what, what they're hoping to achieve from, from the product or what their customers are saying. Um, and then also um, understanding sort of how, um, you know, what, what are customers actually trying to say? Because customers will say, oh, these are our pain points, these are our frustrations, and um, they won't necessarily tell you the solution, but it's balancing um, both needs and having um, conversations with different parts of the organisation from um, the people that are actually building the product, the developers, the engineering, the site operations, through to, okay, um, how will we measure success? Uh, and then UX and design, uh, what do we, you know, what, what will that look like? So um, taking needs from parts of the business, from the customer, and um, trickling... Uh, cascading that back down to the team so um, we have a sense of you know, what do we need to build, what does that look like, how do we build it from the tech side and how will we measure it. Fantastic, thank you. Bing, is data scientist all about numbers? Of course not. I, th I think it's <laughs> so multidisciplinary. I think that's uh, transdisciplinary. Trans I think it's there is so much... Um, skill sets that you need to be able to be a data scientist. I think it's about numbers. Yes, you've got to be comfortable working with a huge amount of data because that's where data is a new currency. You need to be able to massage it, process it. You can't be you know, scared of it. But because of the increase in, in compute power and, and the multiple ways that you can, you know, um, data, you know, the unstructured data that you can analyze right now, the new <coughs> ways that you can look at it, that there's so much that uh, that you need to be able to do as a data scientist to be able to talk to the data, you need coding skill sets. 
you need to be able to um, wrangle the data, uh, you know, and you need to be able to work with data platforms and able to work, manage that huge quantity of data. And then talk about the non-technical skill sets. You need to be able to be good in communication. You need to be able to work well in a team. You need to be able to communicate your ideas. You need to be able to convince customers or management that um, this, this is what um, um, rudimentary methods can, can, can achieve, but with machine learning, with deep learning, with data science, this is where you know, it brings the solution to or it brings the benefits to. I think there is lots of other skill sets that you need. Yes. Fantastic. So it's not just code and not just programming. <laughs> <laughs> so back from your point of view, a UX designer who's looking at user experience and, and also from a visual point of view, is it actually just that you have got a roadmap and you're just planning it out and you're going, yep, these are the steps and I follow them each time? Definitely not. <laughs> I wish it was that way because my job would be so easy. <laughs> um, so I guess UX design, it's, it's pretty different every day. Um, generally, when we start a project at us two, we kind of break it up into three main kind of like sections, I guess. The first one we call sets and listen. And so a huge part of that is a lot of the time just talking to people, talking to our clients, our stakeholders, and talking to their users and understanding from there what the problems are that we're dealing with. Um, there's a million different activities we could do um, through that stage. Some could be assumption mapping, customer journey mapping. There's, I could just list them for days. <laughs> but um, I think the toughest part of being a UX designer is problem solving. Um, understanding where you want to get to and what activities or things you can do to get you that one step closer to identifying what problems you want to tackle and how you want to do that. And then once we kind of get to, well, I, I, you could research forever, but once we decide it's, okay, it's, we're done researching, we start this other phase which we call do and learn, which generally we run in design sprints. So within a week, we rapidly prototype a solution to that problem. And, the ne and synthesize our findings from that, from testing with real users, and then the next week we do it again. And from there, you're just constantly test building, testing, iterating. Um, it, again, could go on forever, but you've got to put a deadline on that one as well. And yeah. then the last one we call build and launch, which is when we ship it. <laughs> Fantastic, so it goes out to the big wide world. Yeah. So Alex, we've heard a little bit about the four different roles. And so from the re research perspective, how in demand are these roles in Sydney? Yeah, they're, I mean, they're, they're, they're very in demand from the higher level startups. Yep. Um, and, and the more mature a startup ecosystem gets, the more these people become really critical. And they're critical because they, they really do block growth if you don't have these roles. I mean, we've talked about this in the abstract somewhat, but you all know what bad UX is because I guarantee you have all gone into a website and been like, I just want to pay for this thing <laughs> and not been able to do it, right? Yep. That's bad UX. And you've all gone to the dentist and say, yes, I promise I floss every night, and you don't. And data analytics is designed to find that out for you, right? <laughs> so I, I used to work in um, a bit of product management stuff for an yeah. education company, and uh, we ran data on uh, the videos that we put out. And we could tell you that if it was a five-minute video, they would watch for five minutes. If it was a seven-minute video, they would watch for seven minutes. Oh, wow. And if it was a 13-minute video, they would watch for seven minutes. Wow. <laughs> seven minutes was the limit. They would never watch further. And so now it's like two and a half minutes, right? <laughs> that's, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's right. So now, and, and you need to communicate that to the rest of the business. You need to say anything you say from seven minutes on will not be listened to, just full stop. You know? So being able to, to take those learnings and, and input them into a startup that's trying to develop a product is really critical. Um, you, the way that, that Uber and Airbnb and all those sort of uh, companies get so big and be able to employ thousands of people across the country is because they absolutely nail all of those little features. And yeah. if you don't have the talent, you don't get to be that big. And so where do you, where would be your advice to people in the room that are considering wanting to go exploring these roles? Where do you think the demand is now in Sydney? Like how do they tap into to where to go? Yeah, I mean, so I think you can, you can hear from the discussion that we've had the elements of, of a lot of these backgrounds. So there's like design is a big part of, of uh, a lot of these roles, right? So it doesn't take that much to take your design background 
input a little bit of maybe some basic coding like literacy and uh, some understanding of the tech sector and bang, you can enter into a, a UX design role. So I think the transdisciplinary approach that, that uh, UTS uh, are implementing is, is a great example of this. It's, it's trying to find ways to take your existing skills, add usually some sort of tech component and yeah. maybe some way of thinking outside the box and getting involved in the tech sector and then you'll find yourself naturally falling into one of these roles or you'll make up a name and we'll have a new role that's really <laughs> critical. <laughs> Fantastic. This one might be a perfect time actually to invite Louise back up onto the stage and while she's doing that, can I ask um, each of you in a, in a quick sentence, can you share with us Adam what your five core skills would be uh, within your product management role? I mean, in your business development role, sorry. Yeah, sure. So in, in business development, number one is curiosity. Curiosity for everyone you meet. What makes them tick? What's interesting in their world? Second one is empathy, actually understanding what matters for them and being able to relate to that. Uh, third one would be, it's a kind of a consequence of the first two, networking. If you enjoy the first two, the third will just come naturally for you. Uh, the fourth is actually understanding the role of, of data. There is no business today that isn't affected by data or technology, so it's, the tech sector doesn't exist anymore. Every business is a tech business one way or another, and if you're a salesperson, you should get across that. Four is enough. Fantastic, and a quiet little plug that we will be concluding tonight with the networking session, so you can upskill in that right here tonight. <laughs> and from your perspective, Magda, what would be the five key skills yeah, you're taking so product? Yeah, so I times two, um, <laughs> basically what um, was said here, but um, being an active listener is is critical um, because when um, you know, being in a customer centric um, environment, you have to want, like not only ask the right questions but also try to like obviously actively listen, but understand what the customer is trying to achieve because um, it won't be explicit. Um, have a sense of data and how to... So be, uh, you know, use data um, to create the right information because what customers say and what, what they do, um, which is the um, analytical side, can be worlds apart. So <laughs> um, reading in between the lines and taking that forward um, to build the right products or features is another one. Um, and uh, to be curious, so yeah, that's definitely um, constantly learning, um, looking at you know, different alternatives and lateral thinking. Fantastic, thank you. And being from your perspective, your core skills for a data scientist? Uh, curiosity, again, you know, yeah, uh, curious about what data can do and what you can do with it, uh, what you can achieve with it. Um, I think another one would be... Uh, uh, the language of of programming, coding, yeah, you know, pick up that language, be conversant in it, be comfortable expressing or churning out what you want from the data to put it into the format that you want, data wrangling, um, to be good in, in maths, statistics, that was the third. Um, yeah, to be able to, yeah, you'll be, you'll be working with huge amounts of data, be, you know, you got to, Turn it out in, in some sort, of, make it out into some sort of sense. Uh, you'll be working with lots of algorithms and so forth. Um, and the fourth one, be comfortable working with huge, huge amounts of data, which means that you'll be using two sets, platforms, um, whatever else, and, and, and to be learning to how to use all this SQL. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that would be... Oh, sorry, communication. Yes. Yeah, to be able to communicate. Yeah. Because you need to help people read that data. Absolutely. Yeah. And back from your point of view. I knew that all of mine would be said before it got to me. Um, but I think empathy is the number one skill required to be a UX designer. Um, yeah, the first thing you can do before you solve a problem is understand what that problem is. Yeah. And by doing that, you need to talk to real people and understand their real needs. Um, the second would be leave your ego at the door. <laughs> um, if you're putting a design in front of a user, they're going to tear it apart because it doesn't meet the needs that they're trying, well, what they're trying to achieve. It doesn't help them to do that. And so you need to be open to uh, putting your work in front of people and understanding their feedback, taking it on board, uh, synthesizing, and then iterating. So you constantly need to change and learn and iterate. Um, the third would be, gosh, um, I think it would definitely be, if you see something that you think is cool, do more of it. 
<laughs> so, oh, I want to do, I want to do that. I, um, I guess the reason why I got into UX, one, one of the main reasons was I used to throw parties with my housemates and we would code projections to put up on the walls that would change based on the music and the people who were in the room at the time. And I said, I want to do more of that. And so I think that's one of the biggest things. Well, I've never been to a party where that's happened. Has anyone else? <laughs> I'm clearly showing my age now. Alex, from your point of view, what do you think are the critical skills that have been mentioned that from all of those wonderful um, organisations that you spoke to and companies? What do you think are some of the core skills that you would say to people in the room are, are your must-haves, those must-haves that people have said that we need in these, in these I, roles? Yeah, I think these guys did a, a very good job. I, I think the, the one sort of principle I would... I would highlight is the, the Google idea of, of coding plus, where they have a, an idea that will take people who are great at coding, but you need a plus. You need some passion, some understanding, yeah. some, some extracurricular that you are really focused on, and we can find ways to make that work. So hold the plus, but, but uh, I think some sort of technical background is, is always going to make you a lot more useful for the tech sector. Fantastic. And Louise, from your point of view, what do you think and, and what do you think are critical advice for people in terms of thinking about upskilling their own, their own personal journeys and careers? Wow. Um, be, I'm saying the same. Be, be curious. Um, question not just why, but also why not? Yeah. Why shouldn't you do it? Don't assume that the problem that you're possibly being asked to solve is the right problem. What if the problem, the question you're being asked, is actually not right? So never assume. Um, don't assume and also go directly to the first solution. That is the wrong way to work. Seek out people who are going to challenge you, people that are actually from other disciplines, um, and they're going to make you better problem solvers. Surround yourself with people. Find people to talk to. Find people that are like-minded. Find people that are different. Step on the cracks in the pavement <laughs> and cross the boundaries in seeking solutions. Don't play safe. Also, and this is particularly around um, big data, think carefully about the ethics of what you're doing and the impact of what you're doing on others. Um, in other words, be predictive, not reactive. Good one. Thank you. We're now going to open up the floor for anyone that has questions that they would like to ask any of our panellists. Would anyone like have a question they'd like to ask, something they'd like to know a little bit more about? You pop your hand in the air. Wonderful. Lots of hands went up. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. We've got some hands down here, 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 and then there was also one just in the middle there. Thank you. So there's a lady down the front here, a gentleman here, and a gentleman just there in the middle. Thank you. Yes, they're all on, so if you just speak, yeah. Not all at once, that is. If you go first. Hi, um, my name is Praveen. I'm uh, doing my master's in UX in the University of Sydney. And I guess my question is kind of directed towards Rebecca, but please, rest of you, please feel free to answer as well. This is a little bit of a longer question, if you will. Um, so in a world where there might be a saturation of startups, you know, there's a fewer niches being explored by startups rather than clones. There's way more clone companies of existing startups. My fear, and I'm, I'm glad to see that UX is up here as one of the four burgeoning industries, but I was, I was pretty surprised to see that. But my fear is that how future-proof is UX? And the reason I'm asking this is because maybe five, six years ago, every website company might have had a UX designer, but with the advent of companies like Wix, Squarespace, there are designs which, those are companies which give you products with already robust UX principles in their designs. So does this mean that as UX designers, is it a shrinking thing where we have to only try to explore it towards like I'd a like it niche? Back to, I might beg, beg to, to jump on in and ask, uh, yeah. to answer that one. Beck, what's yeah, your... I think that's a really interesting question. I think about that a lot, actually. Um, and I think you brought up a really interesting um, idea that uh, Google always seeking people who can do coding plus. And I think as a UX designer or as a product designer, you need to constantly be thinking about what really excites you. And I think from there that you'll find your niche. There are so many copycat startups, like you said. But say when you're creating your portfolio, think about the work that you want to do next. And I, my portfolio, um, I've got so much work that I don't include in there that I think is good work, but I don't want to do it again. And I think from there, you'll 
be able to create something that will really represent you as a person, and I think you'll gravitate, like, work that excites you and interests you will find you. Um, yeah, I think UX is never going to go away. I think it's existed for longer than... It's, it's only just gotten this fancy name in the last couple of years, but it's existed forever. Um, and I think it will continue to exist because products are never finished. They're always, you always need to iterate upon them. You always need to make them better. They can never, if you leave an, an app on the App Store and never update it, update it <laughs> then <laughs> people are going to stop using it. Thank you, Vic. Yes? Um, so I agree that globally tech is going to be a very important industry in the future. But I was just wondering, given the experience I have at work, where most if most the vast majority of my coworkers are um, from overseas, and as well where I've been to Singapore and I've seen the salary differences between overseas and local workers, what do you think is the economics of developing local talent as opposed to just which is what a lot of companies are doing now, just offering all their cap tech capabilities? I'm going to head straight to you, Louise, on this one. <laughs> I hoped you wouldn't on that one. <laughs> I know. That's why I went straight to you. Thank you. Because the solution is what you're creating through your new department. It is. Uh, the education sector is already working in this. And it's not simply, let's do another IT course, let's produce more coders. I mean, we, we launched three years ago a course, um, the Bachelor of Technology and Innovation, for people to think socially across technology, not just, I am going to be a coder, like all the other coders that are coming from IT. The universities are starting to work this way. With some of the universities, it can be like turning a very large tanker. With some, they're slightly more agile. But people like yourselves and people here need to be working with the universities to make this happen and to make it happen fast. Um, unless we actually grow this talent here, um, we are severely limiting where Australia can go. And if I can contribute to that from a business perspective, um, as uh, businesses and organisations, we should support the, um, the talent coming through because a lot of the times um, there's an expectation of having um, a certain level of experience um, and maybe it's... Yeah, there's a gap. It's, it, you're right. Take people on, take interns on, mentor people, yeah. help build them up, come in and offer to say to the universities, what if I came in and mentored some students or sat down with a group and talked to them and actually assisted like them? Traineeships. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm. Doing a degree is not enough. It, it's that mentorship, it's that engagement with industry and all of us here should be, should be working to support that. And from a different point of view, the state government um, is, is really challenging this at a New South Wales level. One of the big goals and the big purpose of the new Aerotropolis that it's just been announced is actually for that to have a very large tech focus. And so one of the things, obviously, that they're looking there is creating essentially 100,000 new tech industry uh, jobs through the new univers universities and things that are going there. So the Sydney economy is really acutely aware of how those jobs need to stay locally. So the city of Sydney is doing really strong work in this space, and as are some of the other state agencies. So it is something that many levels of government are focused on, ensuring that we can generate these opportunities for companies to get the skills they need on our shore and not having to go offshore. So it is certainly better being looked at it at several levels. May I respectfully challenge some of the ideas about this, and I would say drop the patriotism. We're not living in a bounded Australia anymore. We live in the world. I'm a bit of... I'm not a patriot, put it that way, because I'm a human, and there are plenty of humans out there. My best salesperson lives and works from South Africa. My best lawyer lives and works from Singapore. The uh, operations team for Conscious Step are based out of New York. Uh, there's no reason why you have to contain your thinking to the people who turn up to this event. We're actually in a global world where you can find the best talent, the best strange, ironic combination of skills that somehow produced, for example, lawyers with a computer science background that have an interest in sales. Where do you find them? They don't exist. They're unicorns, but there's one or two out there. They live on planet Earth, and that means you can find them. <laughs> and and I, I would just finish and add to that, because obviously, for my accent, I'm a migrant. 
um, of 20 years, but I, I am a migrant. And what we very much encourage students to do um, and people is not just connect to the people in this room, but I would say find the best people around the world. Connect, connect your ideas. The world, it's a global world, and it is certainly a start in Sydney. Our students will work outside of Australia. They will sweep back into Australia. This, is, this is how it the works. World. There was a few more questions. Who's got a... Does anyone have a microphone in their hand? No? Like, excuse me, can I get you over here to bring the lady here a microphone? And there was someone else that had their hand. All right. Um, so, Alex... Just one question. Now we've been talking about data analysis and those type of things. What about robotics as well? So you come in across robotics and you see the need for a lot of courses. And this is to the whole panel because there's another thing. It comes to the, the cost of courses, the length of courses, do you know, uh, upskill quickly and efficiently. Alex, did you want to... So, are you, sorry, are you talking about robotics as a skill or robotics as a disruptor to existing workers? Well, I think just for this panel or this event, uh, from my point of view, I'm into data analysis, data science. Now, past that, I can see there's a need for robotics. That's, yeah, yeah. that's something separate. Uh, it's just a general, very yeah, general. I, I think that absolutely that's, that's one of the, the skills um, that, that is going to be incoming. I think we don't have enough about AI uh, up there. I think AI will, is already dramatically impacting the world and, and people that interact with it in ways that we probably can't imagine now are going to be hugely important in the future as well. So the, this is not meant to be exhaustive and there are definitely specialised uh, tech skills that, that are right on the horizon. And you guys know about specific courses, um, you know, just uh, about robotics courses? I, I would suggest start looking at the universities. What you're going to notice very, very quickly with all of the universities is they are moving into short courses yeah. and micro-credentials, which means small subjects. So oh, you, you don't yes. have to do a whole master's. You can try out smaller subjects. They can build up to a master's if you wish to, but you can just start to take small subjects, the ones that spark your curiosity. Uh, and I will get you, if you'd like to, at the end, you could pop up and ask some, some more questions around that one. Can I get a question here? Thanks. No, no, it's fine. Yep. Is it on? Yep. Yeah, OK. If we are constrained by time, I can ask them in the no, networking. No, no. OK. Um, OK, hi, my name is Grace Jimenez, and I also work in a startup. And I have, um, like, experience that happened to me is that I was, okay, and I'm a product manager, and one day I was describing the activities that I do for work without saying before I'm a product manager, and then this person said to me, so, oh, so you are a UX designer, and I got like, um, well, I do, and my focus is a lot into the user experience, but I am a product manager. So having the opportunity to have him both in the panel, product manager and UX designer, I would like to know like, if you can, uh, if you define like, where is this line between saying, okay, I'm a product manager or I am a UX designer. <laughs> I think, Becky, you were having this exact conversation earlier today. Yeah, it's very interesting. I think um, the product development process requires everyone in the room to be able to put, each other, put ourselves in each other's roles. Say when we're running a design sprint, everyone's in the room. There's the developer in the room, there's the product manager in the room, there's a the UX designer, there's a visual designer. And then there's people from the client side who could be, say, customer service lead or they could be the CEO or someone who's not involved in the product whatsoever but has input from different aspects. I think in that moment everyone is a UX designer and everyone is a product designer and I think sometimes when you're client facing and billing someone then it is easy to break things down and say this is exactly what you're getting but I think at the end of the day the most skilled product designers and product managers are people who can do everything or are excited to stand up and do everything. Mm. And Maggie, it is definitely you... a trans, uh, trans role. Mm. Um, but I'd also say that um, what pr product um, 
does that maybe UX may not is help with the prioritization and works with the business to sort of say, okay, look, this is the end goal, but what do we really need to do? What can we deliver in this month? Um, and what can sort of hold off. And I think that's probably the, the key difference. Um, but we all, we both work with the customers. Uh, we both try to translate needs and um, interpret what they're actually trying to say. Um, but yeah, I, I think from a product perspective, I'd tie it back to the business and ensure that we meet those business objectives. Is there any last questions from the room? Yeah, yep, yep. yep um, I'm kind of, uh, uh, sorry. Um, okay. <laughs> I'm kind of curious from a um, business standpoint and a user interface. With the um, uh, augmented and virtual reality solutions becoming more and more common nowadays, like you've got the HoloLens, you get, your phone can do cool stuff nowadays. When it comes to um, designing websites, do you reckon there'll be like a, um, a bigger, bigger incline to go to more virtual experiences to um, bring in customers, sell your products, and stuff like that? I think that... Um, all of these things that you just listed are awesome things that exist within the market. But I think at the end of the day, if um, someone in a marketing room is saying, we need to make a VR experience, we're going to generate users, everyone's going to love it. If your VR experience needs to be marketed, it's probably not a good VR experience. I think at the end of the day, we need to start at what is that problem? Is that the right problem that we're looking at? And I think that starts with empathy as well. And so from there, you work up and you, uh, you think about what's the best way to uh, design in response to this problem. Sometimes that's AR, sometimes that's VR, sometimes that's a website. I think all of it just depends on the context in which it's going to exist. I do think that AR and VR have a, a place in certain industries. Um, I know that construction are using VR a lot in order to visualize what a constructed building will actually look like and be able to walk around a physical space. Um, I know that uh, there's an Australian startup that specializes in doing VR shop fronts. So you can put things on shelves and uh, stock your, your things exactly how you want them and you can get a better sense of what that UX experience is like. Uh, so I think there's definitely applications that are greater than what we're seeing at the moment that are around the corner, but I agree with you that, that each individual uh, industry or product will require its own uh, marketing sort of styles. Fantastic. So I'm going to conclude um, with the panel tonight and asking you all to give us a, a little bit of a, a top tip um, from yourself to everyone in the room. Louise, what would be your key tip, your key takeaway for people to, to think about as they leave tonight? Don't just assume that because you've started on one path, that's the path you need to remain on. Mm. Actually, really look inside yourself, talk to people, think. Um, the amount of times that my sheer curiosity, it, I take an idea and just disappear down a rabbit hole with it. Um, I'm, f I'm fascinated as to what the possibilities are. So just, just start to apply that to yourself. Fantastic. Thank you. Alex? Um, I'll go with tech is, is just really, really important for the economy. It is going to define Australia's well-being in the next 20 to 30 years. Um, I can give you statistics all day, but, but the two largest companies on the US stock market are larger than the entirety of the ASX, and they're both tech companies. Um, the, it is critical that we focus on, on both the skills and roles and people that we need, but also in supporting our tech sector and the, the importance for understanding the roles tonight. I mean, the, the way that we uh, uh, issue visas in Australia is based on census data. Census data is updated like every five years, so we're five years behind. And so roles that didn't exist five years ago, you physically can't get a visa for, um, despite the fact that they may be really critical to Australia's tech sector. So we're all about to vote in a bunch of different major elections, some state, some federal. <laughs> There's going to be 25 million votes cast in the next uh, six months. And think about the tech sector when you're doing it. So, Alex, one last piece of advice from you too. In your report, you, you mentioned that you did this research and asking parents, and parents are asking you, you know, what should, your, what, what, what should our children do? What mm. is your advice to any parents in the room in terms of how they talk to their, their children in terms of their next career path, given what yeah, you Yeah, I was said? going to pick on you, Pravin, uh, 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 for saying uh, future-proofing about your job. I think you future-proof yourself, not, not the job. Yeah. I, I think the, the goal is to get as stuck in as you can uh, to what you feel is, is the, the cutting edge and uh, grow and develop and move with 
the economy as it moves. Um, because trying to hold on to a classic position is probably not the best way in a very changing world. Um, so I'd say grow yourself. Fantastic, thank you. Beck, what's your key tip? I was going to say something very similar. Ah. The, I do. Like you, said, you said it so nicely. Future-proofing yourself is just the coolest way to think about it. Always look out for the next thing that you want to move into. Never sit still. Always be fearless and look at what's coming next, what your current job can do for you and what you can learn from that. Um, yeah, I think that um, do more of what, you, what excites you. Fantastic. Bing? Well... I was going to say something, <laughs> but, but I was, uh, yeah, dive in, dive in, don't just wonder uh, about it, dive in, try it for yourself, um, get going, yeah. Fantastic, thank yeah. you. And um, yeah, be comfortable with uncertainty, yeah. so dive in knowing that maybe that thing isn't quite right, but you know, you'll always find your way. Um, and yeah, so if you have an idea, whether it's for your own startup or even something within the business, um, it's great to have that vision piece and something that's like maybe the North Star. But what's, think about like, if I had to do something in the next fortnight, what could I do to actually test that? And um, sometimes that may mean that that test, that experiment may not actually have um, verified the idea. So um, keep at it. So there's a scientific approach, but if it fails, it's okay. And Adam, other than buying your socks, what's your tip? <laughs> Number one, go to Toastmasters so you can learn how to present your ideas, otherwise your ideas will land on deaf ears. Uh, number two, take your social life seriously. The people you spend your time with are the ones you'll become friends with. You can actually be intentional about who that is. It'll make a huge difference for the long term. Number three, bit of bad news. The whole world changed since 9 a.m. this morning. Mm -hmm. uh, someone's invented an AI that does UX and has automated data science and is, is automatically making customers appear. Good news is, world changed since 9 a.m. and we're all on the same page, so there's a chance for all of us to actually learn what's next and build it for yourself. There are so many areas where there isn't an expert because it hasn't existed for long enough. These jobs have only just appeared. That's a huge opportunity. Thank you so much. And my tip for all of you is the plus, and it's the passion. So the City of Sydney have been running these events uh, for so many years, and the one thing that we hear time and time and time again is find your passion point, because that's what will help you to succeed and take any of these skills or take all of this desire you've got, but it's the passion that will help drive it home. So that's our, our tip from, from me. So if you could all join me in thanking our guests, that would be really lovely. So thank you all so much. <laughs> So one of the key tips that Adam actually said was networking was an important skill that you mm -hmm. need to have. So with that, we'd have, love to have our speakers actually make their way out to the room that you began in. If you could all just stay seated for two seconds <laughs> while they make their way out, um, they're going to get unmicrophoned and then be available for you to ask any personalised questions. Please fe feel free to pumble them with questions because they have so much experience and expertise and they, really, they are really connected and networked in the, in the Sydney scene. So they certainly may be able to help you connect into some ideas or some people that you may well need to. So just a little bit of um, a, a wrap up from us. We um, have been doing these um, events for several times. This is actually the Visiting Entrepreneurs Program, a brand new event for the City of Sydney this year. And we're really keen on feedback. Um, the city uses all the feedback we get from these events to make sure we curate, we, we modify, we specialise events as we go forward. So we really, really would love um, for you to take your time for like a little tiny, weeny second to do us a um, survey. So if you just could um, grab out your phone, if you have it, I'm sure everyone does. Um, and you can actually find there's a little QR our code there for you to, to pop on to, to uh, fill out a survey for us. We really appreciate it because it does really help us to generally curate events uh, for next year. And some people, you're yeah, taking a photo of it and doing it later. That's absolutely fine. You may do that. We don't mind.
while you're doing that, I would also once again like to thank our, our event partners tonight, which was UTS and Startup Oz. They've really helped the City of Sydney to help put on these events, so we really appreciate their expertise and also their assistance in, in doing so. We encourage you to stay behind, network, talk to each other, have that opportunity um, to, to find out some more information. We will be sending you the video that came from tonight, so you'll watch your email, you'll find that in your inbox in the next several days. Um, we do thank you so much for taking your time out of your busy diary, and we hope that you've gained some value out of being here. So my thanks to you for giving up your night to be with us, so thanks so much. <laughs>